हरि ओम वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट द ह्यूमन स्केलेटल सिस्टम दैट्स अबाउट द बोन्स इन आवर बॉडी एंड द जॉइंट्स इन आवर बॉडी here this is just an overview of the human skeletal system you can see the complete skeleton all the bones in the human body so you have two views from behind and from the front how the body looks from within this is actually the support of our body like one of the functions of the human skeleton is to support our body without this bones without this skeleton without the joints there would be no support from within to our body parts so this was just an overview now when we talk about the bones in our body as grown up people we have bones which are strong which are hard which have lots of strength in them then when these bones are being formed the process of bone formation it is called as ossification so this process of bone formation it starts during the pregnancy itself like when the baby is in the mother's womb when the baby is growing during pregnancy during pregnancy itself the bones they start developing now as i said earlier our bones are strong and hard but during the development or at the starting point of the development the bones they are just represented by a thin membrane and over this membrane there is deposition of calcium magnesium and phosphorus mainly it's calcium to a certain extent little amounts of magnesium and phosphorus so each and every bone is represented by a membrane and over this membrane there is deposition of calcium now layers after layers the deposition of calcium goes on like the first layer then over the first layer it would be the second layer and over the second layer it would be third the fourth and so on so slowly this membrane starts developing into a cartilage a cartilage you can say it's a soft bone so because of the deposition of calcium because of the deposition of the salts the minerals the membrane gets converted into a cartilage and the process goes on and the cartilage ultimately develops into a bone which is strong and hard so we can say that the cartilage is the intermediate stage where the bone is soft it's not very strong it's not very hard but it's so the process of bone formation the process of ossification starts during pregnancy the membrane gets converted into a cartilage and the cartilage gets converted into the bone now this process it started during pregnancy but then it continues even after the birth when the baby is born when the kid is born even after that this process continues and this process it continues to around 20 years of our life of course it depends on your calcium intake it depends on your ethnic group it depends on your genes but then on an average the process of ossification it continues up to the age of around 20 years now it's important to note the age of ossification because till that age the length of our bones it goes on increasing 
or the bones they grow in size they grow in thickness and at the same time they grow in their length now when the bones increase the length obviously the height of that person is going to increase so the age of ossification is important because when the ossification stops the length of the bones is not going to increase the length of the bone will stop increasing when the process of ossification stops or indirectly i am mentioning that the height of the person will not increase once the process of ossification once the process of bone formation is completed this is very important from a yogic point of view also from yogasan practice point of view because some yogasan for example the tree pose the mountain pose the triangle pose the warrior pose and many more in the effects it has been mentioned that if you practice these yoga positions these asanas on a regular basis it will help you to increase your height but it's important to note that if these asanas are practiced before the ossification has completed only then you will get the benefit of increasing the height once the process of ossification is completed there is no way that the height would increase yoga is not a magic it's a scientific so this point is to be remembered if some students come to you specifically with the aim of increasing their height with the practice of yoga sun yoga postures next important point is the components the composition of the bones as we said earlier it's calcium or up to a certain extent even magnesium and phosphorus so in a fully grown person the proportion is 70% of the bone is formed with calcium magnesium and phosphorus and the remaining 30% is proteins fats and carbohydrates 70% of the bone is mostly salts and minerals and 30% of the bones is proteins fats and carbs so this minerals the 70% it gives strength to the bone and the remaining 30% it gives slight flexibility to the bone so our bones they are strong and hard but at the same time they are slightly flexible now the situation the composition of the bones is slightly different in children in children proportionately you have more of proteins fats and carbohydrates less of calcium because the process of bone formation is still going on the calcium is being still deposited in the bones so proportionately there is less calcium in the bones of children now this makes the bones of children more flexible with less strength and hardness the so children they are having flexible bones more comparatively more flexible bones and they are less hard with less strength now sometimes it is mentioned that yogasan are not to be practiced by children they are around up to the age of 10 or 12 years one of the important reason is that when you are practicing yogasan in the authentic traditional way you are expected to hold the position for longer duration of time 
so if children practice yoga sun on a regular basis holding their position for a longer duration of time because of the flexibility of the bone because the bones are having less strength there is a possibility that the bones would develop abnormal bend and abnormal curvature so if children are practicing yoga or yoga sun then one important point to be noted is they should not be holding the positions for a long duration of time they can get into the position maybe just be in the position for a couple of breaths and release the position no long time holding of the position yogasan in children that's very very important and the other extreme of life old age as far as old age is concerned they can practice yoga at old age whatever age of the person yoga practice can be continued of course respecting the limitations of your health respecting the limitations of the complaints which your body has say for example at an old age someone having pain extreme pain in knee joint we would not recommend him or her to sit in vajrasan as they are having pain in their knee joint so respect your limitations respect your age respect your health and practice yoga accordingly even at an older age now this is just an information to mention that the bones they are hollow from inside the long bones the bigger bones in our body they are hollow from inside and this hollow structure is filled up with bone marrow and this is the place where the blood cells they are develop inside our bones so this was just in short for your information it's called as the red bone marrow marrow red bone marrow which is inside the hollow structure within the bones now let us talk about joints whenever we are talking about bones whenever we are talking about the skeletal system it's important to talk about joints because joints are responsible for the movement in our body just imagine if there are only bones but there are no joints any movement in our body would be impossible so for a joint formation at least two bones or two bony ends they should come together to form the joint and this joint is held in position by the ligaments and the muscles around it so this is a sketch of a typical joint in our body so as you can see that there are two bones or two bony ends coming close to each other but then you can see that the two bones two ends of the bones they never touch each other any joint in our body the two ends of the bones they will never touch each other there is a slight gap in between the two ends of the bones obviously to avoid friction whenever the joint is moving next you can see that over the end of the bone there is a covering of cartilage as we mentioned earlier cartilage is a soft bone it's a soft tissue 
so if the bony ends they are covered by the cartilage wherever the joint is moving if these two ends they come closer to each other the friction will be minimized because the cartilage is a soft tissue and it will prevent the bones from coming in contact with each other so this cartilage will help to minimize the friction and it will help to prevent the pain when the bones are moving the joints are moving next you can see that in the place as i said the two bones they are not touching each other so in the place in between that there is a fluid which is called as a joint fluid you can call it even a synovial fluid so this fluid it's a sticky oily fluid and obviously when i say it's a sticky oily fluid the function of this fluid is to act as a lubricant so whenever the joint is moving this fluid will work as a lubricant and it will prevent friction in the joint it will prevent pain in the joint and all these structures the bony ends in the joint the covering of the cartilage in the joint the joint fluid all the structures they are enclosed they are covered up in a capsule which is called as joint capsule or even you can call it as a synovial membrane so all these structures they are within inside this joint capsule and over the joint capsule we have the ligaments which will hold the position of the joint which will make the joint stable and also there will be muscles which will help in the movements of the joint so ligaments they give more stability to the joints they give firmness to the joints and muscles they help in the movements in the flexibility of the joint so in short this was the structure of a typical joint in the human body now there are different types of joints in the human body so mainly the joints they are classed classified into two types first is the fixed joints and the the second type is the mobile joints so the names the words they are self explanatory fixed joints are the joints where movements are not possible so there is a joint but movements are not possible the examples are the joints in our skull they are fixed joints and even the joints in our vertebra in our backbone they are classified as fixed joints and the second type is mobile joints or the joints where movements are possible so these mobile joints they are further of four types the ball and socket joint then the second type is the sliding joint the third type is the hinge joint and the fourth type is the pivot joint so first let us see an example one each of the joints so mobile joints ball and socket the first type here you can see a example of the hip joint the rotational movement is possible in hip joint it's because it's a ball and socket joint another example is the shoulder joint we can rotate our shoulder because it's a ball and socket joint the second type is the hinge joint the example what you see here is the elbow joint a better example we can 
mention is the knee joint. So hinges, as we all know that the door has hinges and when you want to open the door, the door can open only in one direction if the hinges are applied to the door. Similarly, for example, if you want to bend your knee, you can bend the knee only in one direction. The movement in the opposite direction is locked. That's because it's a hinge joint. The next type is the sliding joint. Some books mention it as gliding joint or sometimes it is also mentioned as plane joint. Gliding, sliding, plane joint, it's the same. The example here, what you see is the wrist joint. Another example is the ankle joint. And the fourth type of mobile joint is the pivot joint, which is in the first and second bone of our neck. So when we are moving our neck, when we are moving our head in a shoulder to shoulder movement, or it's actually a half rotation of the neck, shoulder to shoulder movement, or the movement when we say no with our head, that's the movement in between the first and second joint of our neck, called as the pivot joint. What we are more interested is in the immobile joint or the fixed joint of our back or the vertebrae. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the vertebra or the backbone or the bones in the back, it is technically said to be fixed joint. And fixed joint means movement is not possible. And then, of course, you would say that we can bend backwards, we can bend forwards, we can move our backbone and how it's said that movement is not possible. So when we are moving backwards, forwards or move, making the movements of our backbone, it's actually the complete movement of all the bones in the back. If you want to make a movement at a particular point in our back, a specific point in our back, that movement is not possible. If I ask you that bend forwards in the 8th and the ninth vertebra, practically it is not possible that you bend only at the level of the 8th and ninth vertebra, or the backbone. It works like a spring action. So when you are bending forwards, it bends forwards like a spring. When you are bending backwards, it will work backwards like a spring. You cannot do the movement at one particular point. So it is classified as a fixed joint. But as such, movements are possible. So when we say backbone, actually everyone of us knows that it's not one single bone. There are multiple bones in the back. So in our neck region, there are seven bones. In the chest region, there are 12 bones. In the lumbar region, there are five bones. And then below the lumbar region, it's the sacral and the coccygeal region with five plus one bones. So it's not a single bone. It's a chain of multiple bones. And this chain of multiple bones is placed one above the other. But then, interestingly, this placement of bones one above the other in a chain, it is not in a straight vertical line. Our backbone is not straight, but the word used for it is erect. It's not like a straight line, but then there are curves in our backbone. The first curve is in the neck. 
the neck is slightly towards the forward direction. Then the chest or the thoracic area is slightly bent in the backward direction. And then the lumbar area, again, it's bent in the forward direction. And below the lumbar area, the sacral and the coccygeal, it's bent in the backward direction. So it's alternate neck region forwards, chest region backwards, the lumbar region forwards, and the sacral region backwards. Now this unique structure of the human backbone, human vertebral column, helps us to balance our body on two legs. So we human beings, we are able, we are capable of balancing ourselves on two legs because of this unique structure of our backbone because of the vertebral column. And the second important thing is because of this curves, the vertebral column, the backbone, it works as a good shock absorber. So whatever jerks, whatever shocks we receive from the ground goes to the legs and from the legs go to the lumbar area and from the lumbar area they can travel upwards but then these shocks, these jerks, they are minimized because of this unique curved structure of our back. So maintaining these curves of the back is very very important in our day-to-day -day life and of course whenever we are practicing yoga most of the problems of the vertebral column of the back they are because of wrong lifestyle and wrong postures of sitting standing walking and other day-to-day -day activities. Commonest what happens is we don't sit erect. Most of the times we sit bending forwards or at least we are having our neck bent forwards. So if you are unable to maintain the erectness the curves of our backbone then it will develop into trouble like the simplest of it what we can talk is the back pain most of the times it's because of the lifestyle now when we are talking about the lifestyle and its correlation with the joints, I can mention that our joints in our day-to-day -day life, we are utilizing them in roughly three different ways. Sometimes we overuse our joints. Sometimes we don't use our joints. And sometimes we misuse our joints. Overuse, no use, and misuse. Quick examples of each of them. Overuse, example knee joint. If we are standing for an extended period of time, we are overusing our knee joint. Maybe it's your duty, it's your job, it's your profession that demands you to stand and do your work. But then while doing it, you are overusing your knee joint. Second is no use. A simple example is bending backwards. We can bend backwards. It's a natural movement in our back, in our backbone, in our vertical column. But very rarely in our day-to-day -day life, we bend backwards or 
even the rotation of the spine rotation of our vertebral column rotation of our backbone it is possible it is a natural movement but usually we do not do it so no use of the joints and the third is misuse of the joints again maybe not maintaining the posture of your backbone the erectness of your backbone sitting bending forwards is a misuse of the joints another example maybe when you are standing you don't stand properly by distributing your body weight equally on both the legs maybe you are shifting your body weight on one leg and the other leg is relaxed so one knee joint is being troubled and the whole body weight is transferred to that one single knee joint that's misuse of joint so overuse misuse and no use of joints creates a problems at the level of joints and obviously when i say at the level of the joints it is also the muscles and ligaments which are involved so it creates trouble if you are overusing misusing or not using the joints in your day to day life it creates a problem with the bone it creates a problem with the joint it creates a problem with the muscles and ligaments and if you look closer at the vertebral column then through this vertebral column through this backbone the spinal cord it runs through the backbone it's called as the extension of the brain and at the same time there are nerves which are coming out from in between the two vertebrae so it can cause problem improper utilization can even cause problem to the nerves which are coming outside from in between the two vertebrae so it can cause trouble to the nerve it can cause trouble even to the spinal cord and then of course you might be aware that in between the two vertebrae there is a intervertebral disc or it's a cartilage soft tissue so this intervertebral disc can also be damaged if you are not utilizing the joints properly or if you are if you are overusing your joints here i am specially talking about the backbone so one of the basic advantages one of the basic advantages of yogic practices is you learn to utilize your joints in a proper way and of course the optimum utilization by improving your flexibility that's the next point but then proper utilization of joints with a proper yogasan practice or even with proper slow gentle movements it improves the blood circulation around the joints so the health of the joint is improved the wear and tear of the joint is reduced by simple yogic movements and another advantage is whenever the blood circulation to the joint is improved the metabolic waste products from the joint it can be drained out and they can be thrown out of the body and also it will help in the recycling of the synovial fluid the joint fluid what we mentioned so the recycling of the fluid will be enhanced if the blood circulation improves to the joint and a simple way of improving the blood circulation 
is by doing simple yogic practices or even movements. So at a very physical level, we would train ourselves, we would learn how to utilize the joints properly, what is the maximum range or the minimum range of the movement of a particular joint, we will improve the blood circulation to the joints in particular, it will help to improve the strength of the joint and it will help to reduce the wear and tear of our joint. And of course, further on, it will help us to improve the flexibility of our joints. Next slide is just the bones of the skull, the fixed joints which I mentioned, but nothing to do directly with the yogic practices, so we will not talk about it, much about it. And lastly, the functions of the skeletal system, the functions of the bones. As we mentioned at the start of the lecture itself, it would support the body. It's the support of the body, body, the bones. And at the same time, it also protects the body organs, especially the vital body organs like the heart and lungs, they are inside the rib cage. The bones are protecting our heart and lungs. And the most important thing, it's locomotion, movement. Without skeletal system, without joints, no movement would be possible. Of course, muscles and ligaments would be necessary, but then joints is primarily important. And then of course it is also a storage of salts and minerals like calcium for example. It's in the bones so it is a storage of calcium, it's a storage of minerals. So these are in short the functions of the skeletal system. So that's all for the time being as far as the skeletal system is concerned. We stop here talking about the bones, the human skeletal system. Are you?